Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Leonard Hamilton has spent five decades in college basketball. The head coach at Florida State University, Hamilton is the Seminoles' all-time winningest coach and the fifth winningest coach in ACC history. This season, he won ACC Coach of the Year honors and guided Florida State to the number four ranking in the country and its first ACC championship. But the opportunity to compete for the national championship will have to wait another year as the NCAA tournament was canceled amid concerns about the spread of the coronavirus. The thing is, this story is so much more than basketball, which is why I'm so excited to share it with you today. Coach Hamilton grew up in an era of segregation in Gastonia, North Carolina. The oldest of six children, his parents preached the importance of hard work and education, two things he still values deeply. Today in our conversation, Coach Hamilton shares his incredible personal story and the moment where he thought he gave up coaching for good. We talk about the hurdles that he had to overcome, how he became known as a coach who could rebuild any program, and how he coaches selflessness and resiliency in his players. This episode was recorded before the announcement of the tournament cancellation, and Coach Hamilton was gracious enough to connect again this week to share his thoughts about what happened and his message to his team. I think it's worth a listen as we all navigate the change and uncertainty around us as leaders. Here we go. This is my conversation with Florida State men's basketball coach, Leonard Hamilton. So coach, since we first chatted, you know, (laughs) A few things have changed in, in the world that we live in. And, and obviously, you know, I just wanted to sort of, you know, obviously, I mean, you and your guys are outside warming up for for the first game of the ACC championship and you get tapped on the shoulder and your guys get pulled back into the locker room and the game gets canceled and the ACC tournament gets canceled. What did you say to your guys when you walked into that locker room? Like maybe you can get me inside of that moment a, a little bit as a coach and a leader, how you dealt with that. Well, in the first place, as we got on the bus going to the arena uh, early on, about 10, 10 with games, at, well, I think it was at 12.30, I had some concerns uh, about the climate that we were operating in and the fact that we had already reduced the number of people that could come to the game to only uh, our necessary, actual necessary participants and, and families of the players. Which, which, which really sent a signal that there was, there was a lot to be concerned about uh, as it relates to how we were all dealing with the, the virus and the potential dangers that it presented. And so even though I was looking forward to the game, I had an uneasy feeling in my stomach only because we're responsible for the well-being of the players while they're under our watch. And I was just concerned that if if the situation was was such that we were eliminating people from being in the arena, that that meant that there was a lot of unanswered questions floating around about the whole nature of what we were dealing with, the uncertainty surrounding it. Sure. And I I I, I let my coaches know as we got on the bus that it was a good chance that these games could be canceled because of. The, the potential is being all over the place. Sure. So once we got to the arena, as a staff, we had further discussions about the potential uh, of this, of the season being canceled. And I mean, the uh, tournament being canceled. And so I was not surprised at all. But once we started our pregame preparation and our players went out on the floor to warm up uh, as we were finishing up, the athletic director came in and and summoned me outside to the coach's locker room. And when he let me know, I was not surprised at all. I felt that that we were in a situation where it could have gone either way and that the powers to be 
kind of felt that they were going to err, they were going to err on the side of being cautious, and I totally understood it. So our players went out, they started, they warmed up, and when they came back, and I spoke with them, and I, 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 I tried to preface it like I do every other thing that we have to deal with. There are sacrifices that we have to make. There are challenges in life that we don't have control over, and this was one. And that the decision had been made to cancel the AC term, tournament in in for the betterment and safety of them mm -hmm. and the potential dangers that it could cause in the event that someone was a, had been affected and had no symptoms. There was absolutely no way you could safeguard against what was going on at this day and time and that even though we were disappointed it, it, it was for the betterment of everybody involved and we had to accept it. I mm -hmm. tried to explain to them that life sometimes throws you these types of cur curveballs that we have to learn to deal with even though they aren't very pleasant. Right. And then and, and I explained to them as bad as it is and as disappointed as we are if this is the, the worst disappointment we're going to have in life we're going to have a pretty good life. Right. <laughs> sure. And then fast forward right to the NCAA tournament. I mean, you've got a group of guys that have a shot, right? And a, a special group of guys. And, and then the NCAA tournament gets canceled. Tell me about, you know, the conversation there in the, in, in the locker room with the guys and, and even particularly, right, your seniors. Well, Molly, we, we've tried to all along teach our players they are saying – some things in life you just have no control of. Mm -hmm. If you spend all your time worrying about what you can't control, then you're going to be wasting an awful lot of time. Sure. <laughs> and so the, 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 the mere fact that that, that is all was counseled speaks volumes about the severity of, of, of the situation. Sure. What we were sacrificing is a unique and special opportunity to satisfy our desires and our goals. But in reality... That's small and pale in, in, in relation to the potential negative effect that someone could lose their life as a result of being infected. That doesn't even come compare come compare to, to to that situation. So we put it in perspective. Yeah. Our guys accepted it, and we've moved on. Well, Coach, thanks for taking a minute to shed a little light on our current situation and. Um, you stay safe and, and certainly stay healthy, all right, Coach? Thank you very much. All right, Coach Hamilton, what a treat to have you on. This is a busy time of year for you, so thank you so much for taking a minute. Well, I'm, I'm always happy to, to be a part of, of anything that has anything to do with, with our profession. You know, I enjoy what I do and Enjoy working with the young people, and uh, basketball is one of those spectator spectator sports that, because of you, can see the you can see their facial expressions, you can look at their body language, you can see what they, they used to say the the agony of defeat and the the, the thrill of victory. You, you can see the emotions, and uh, it's a spectator sport. Everybody feel like they got an answer; they can be involved. There are so many armchair quarterbacks, <laughs> and I just think it's just a great sport. And and from my perspective, uh, I, I look at it as you taking youngsters who worked hard to earn a scholarship that's that's going to help them get their education and have a a, a much better way of life. So. As far as I'm concerned, it's all good. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, I know they're there playing basketball for you, but there's no doubt. You're trying to make them better men, too, which is huge, which is huge. Coach, tell me this. What what made you want to get into coaching, and, and what motivates you you know, to stay in it now? Well, to be very honest with you, I had a minister tell me you know, once that God has a purpose for all of us. And the challenge for us as individuals is to fulfill the purpose that God has for each and every one of us on earth. And how you understand that you fulfill in that anointed purpose for you is that a piece of understanding comes over you where you feel good about what you do each and every day that is not necessarily a grind or stressful is that you're doing what comes natural to you 
you feel good about it, and you are involved in it to the point where your passion, your emotions, your 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 focus is in it totally, and you are happy about it, and that's where I feel. <clears throat> so I, I just happen to be fortunate enough to evolve into coaching that has allowed me to enjoy the manifestations of the interactions of the youngsters and as opposed to focusing all on just the aspect that meets the public eye and that's winning. Sure. There are so many more important things involved in coaching that makes a difference. If as a coach, if I only have wins, trophies, recognitions. If that's all I have when I hang up my whistle, then I then I've, I I have not been very effective. As a basketball coach, you take teenagers and you urge them into young adulthood, and so my reward is when they send me a Christmas card, when they call me on Father's Day when they invite you to become, they want you to be at their weddings, when they want you to meet their fiancés, when they want you to be the godparents of their kids. That's the reward. When they seek advice from you that are important decisions in their life, that's the reward I enjoy. Sure. Not Coach of the Year awards, not being on television or being recognized and signing autographs. Those things are small because... When you look back at your career, what kind of husbands, fathers, neighbors, and citizens have you influenced? Sure. Because most most young people emulate the people who they have the most respect for. So if you, it could be their parents, it could be their mothers, it could be their, their coaches, it could be their ministers, but I've, we've had such great relationship with our players that it makes such a difference when you can feel good about what you do every day. See, in reality, Molly, you can really can't really evaluate me as to what job we are doing as a staff until five, six, seven years after <laughs> players have left you and gone on with their lives. That's when you, re- you, you have a chance to judge what you've done. Whether or not you, the wins allow you to keep doing what you love to do so it's important that you have certain level of success you know how many kids are graduating you know right. what are they doing right you know how where, where are they in life and that's what i enjoy so I, I i'm fortunate to be in it that's why i stay in it and uh i enjoy coming to work every day because i think you're making not only a, you're making a huge difference and most of the gears we get, well, a large majority of them are first-generation college students. Wow. They're sure. the first youngsters to go to college in their family, and they're changing the whole culture of their family. In other words, they, their siblings, that look up to them. They set the tone for their cousins and their nieces. Hey, Johnny is gone. They see him on TV. They see him making progress, and that influences sometimes another generation. So what we do, it makes a huge difference away from whether or not you go into the NCAA tournament, whether or not you rank nationally, whether or not you own national TV. That's just the, the byproducts of, of what's really, really important from a coach's perspective. Well, it's so much more than basketball, right, is what you're saying. I mean, it's so much more than basketball. And I bet you spend a lot of your time and energy certainly on the court with the guys, but, you know, what I don't think the world sees is all the time and energy you spend with the relational part of it, with the, with the guy, with the human being to, to do all the things that you're talking about separate and apart from being able to, to, to shoot a basketball. Well, that's the part that I enjoy. Mm-hmm. And uh, you actually surrogate parents right. for probably 15 to 18 kids. Right, sure. And you have to take your job seriously. No question. And you try to give them, you try to help them develop the tools so they can enjoy their lives. No question. And uh, the, 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 the information that they get from you, the standards that you set, 
the challenges that you give them, you helping them grow to young adulthood. And that's what I really, really enjoy doing. That's what matters most. Share a little bit about your background growing up, because I know this has been and played a significant part in the way in which you approach coaching and, and mentoring these young kids. Well, Molly, I always believe that we are who we are as individuals as a result of what we have been exposed to at an early stage in your life. Now, sometimes you are able to overcome uh, negatives. Sometimes uh, in life, you don't realize sometimes your humble beginning and the, and the obstacles that you have to overcome can end up being pluses for you as opposed to how you grow and how you develop. Mm-hmm. And I think that was definitely was was, was in my case. Uh, obviously, you know, I grew up in a little small town called Gastonia, North Carolina, you know, where it was a textile industrial corporated area, one of the largest in the world, where we made cloth and a lot of, a lot of textile mills. Everybody could get a job, but nobody could make any money. So everybody was everybody was below the poverty line, but everybody was the same. So you really didn't know how poor you really were. That was just kind of part of the community. You know, I grew up in segregation where, you know, uh, I went to a predominantly all black high school. Well, in my entire uh, early beginning elementary school, junior high and high school, and it was uh, it was extremely segregated in everything that we did. You know, and we drank at the colored water fountain, and there was certain there was restaurants we couldn't go in and eat. And we had, if we went to the movie, we had to sit up in the balcony. We couldn't sit in the in the theater with everybody else. Mm. You know, certain restaurants you you had to have food served to you through a cubicle in the side of the door, which caused you couldn't go into the restaurant. You know, we used the colored water fountain, the colored bathroom, set rode in the back of the bus. It was a tough start of uh, uh, eight people living in a two bedroom, four boys on two bunk beds in, in one room. You know, our, our, our bathroom was on the back porch, you know, hot and cold running water. What I did have, I had a mother and a father who loved me dearly. My mother went to the seventh grade. My father went to the ninth grade, you know, and uh, all my father told me was that if you're going to have anything in life, you got to get your education. And he had absolutely no money to fund my education that, you know, I had to get, had to get education and that I had to earn a scholarship some way in order to be able to get your education. But he kept pounding that if you didn't get your education, you know, you probably wasn't going to end up in the same situation that we were living in. If you wanted to have a better way of life, you had to do that by educating yourself and preparing yourself so that you could not have to, do what they were doing. My father was a truck driver and my mother was a domestic worker. And uh, that, that's, that's the way our life began. But as a result of, of having to learn how to do with less, I think it made me a little more focused, a little more determined. And, and it was absolutely no doubt what the plan had to be. And I've always been focused on that. No question. No question. Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, learning, uh, a course, about you and, and your life and, and certainly your career, both as a, as a player and a coach, it's interesting. At age 26, you quit coaching and, and took a job as a chemical salesman. You know, can you share a little bit about that story? Because it seemed to be a pretty defining moment in your life, personally and, and certainly professionally. Well, what, what had happened is that my father gave me a couple of interesting philosophical approaches to life. Number one, he always said, don't let anybody outwork you. Now, now that's, that's a cliche that some people live, but from all I remember from nine, eight, nine, ten years old, you can't let anybody outwork you. And, and I remember like it was yesterday, he would say, because your supervisor, your boss, your teacher, your coach might make a, a mistake in how they evaluate you. And so you have to give it all you have in everything that you do. He would say things like, don't ever let anybody, don't ever bend over. Always stand up and breathe through your nose. Don't ever let anybody know you're tired. Don't ever show those, <laughs> those, those emotions. 
And then he, and then the second thing he said, don't come to me complaining. <laughs> don't use me to make an excuse as to why you did not succeed. Sure, find a way. You control your own destiny. If someone beats you out, if somebody gets the position, if someone is better than you, then you got to figure out a way how to earn your stripes. So I've always been an extremely hard worker because that's all I've ever known. And I never had anybody to complain to. And I had to control the outcome of my own uh, being and, and, and objective. And so I was always uh, independent thinking and always motivated by the fact that what I could control is my effort. And so I, I became discouraged once. I mean, I went, obviously, going to Gaston Community College and mm -hmm. starting that basketball program and then going to UT Martin being the first black athlete they had in there at school. All those things were, were, were somewhat challenging. Even during those days, I was just fortunate to have opportunities to get into situations as a result of relationships that I've established. And I just felt that once again, my steps were ordered. I thought that I was, I was, I was, I was being prepared for the purpose that God had for me, even though I didn't know that I was being prepared for it. Mm -hmm. uh, this just happened to be focused on the goal of getting the education, have to learn how to work hard, how to, and along the way, you know, not allowing yourself to get in trouble and staying away from things that, that um, would create stumbling blocks for you in order to be successful. All those things I had ingrained in me on the journey of understanding that you can't get your education and be somebody if you're going to get in trouble and hang with the wrong people and, and do all those things. So that was just kind of part of, of, of what prepared me to be able to go into segregated situations and integrate them and be able to get along. In my neighborhood where I grew up, we had very little interaction racially with anybody other than people who look like us. So, you know, you, you had to have a, and, and then one of the things that I think that made a difference in my life is that I never lived more than 50 yards from my church. Mm -hmm. I've heard you say that. Every time the church opened, I was in it. I mean, that was our livelihood, Sunday school, uh, BTU, Bible, Bible Vacation Bible School, the Urshia Board, the choir, the pl the Christmas plays, the the Easter plays, uh, you know, the the speeches that you had to give. All those things, you know, help you become who you are. And the fact that the church was so close to my house, I could hear the piano from my bedroom. And uh, it was always, because uh, those churches didn't have air conditioning, the windows were always open. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, 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 what a so gift, though. Hear, That's awesome. So, so you could hear very well. Absolutely. So as I, as I went through that, uh, my senior year, uh, I felt that the only way I was going to further, uh, you know, I was going to have to join the Army. Because back in those days, you were, uh, you know, it was, it was mandatory that you had to spend a certain amount of time in the Army. And so in order to get my education, uh, we decided that I would be an advanced ROTC, and I was fortunate enough that Lake Kelly, who was the head coach at Austin P at the time, interviewed me for a graduate assistant position, and uh, I was he, he offered me a job. So my first job was as a graduate assistant, and I was married, and I had a, had a son. And so we moved to Clarksville, Tennessee. But nothing changed for me from my philosophy. So now, once again, I call this divine in intervention because as a graduate assistant, the full-time assistant coach became ill in January and had to resign. So there I was, barely older than the players <laughs> that I was coaching. Sure, that's tricky. And I, I was all what Coach Kelly had. In other words, now I go from being a graduate assistant in graduate school, teaching classes and taking classes, to being having all the responsibilities of a full-time assistant coach when I was really younger than some of the players that were on the team. <laughs> so I was put into a situation where I had, to, I had to be able to coach guys older than me. So I had to earn the respect of them. I had to be able to teach them what Coach Kelly was explaining to me, I had to 
my responsibility. And so I was put in a situation where I had to grow up fast. I had to help teach them when I was younger than them. So I had to be knowledgeable. I had to learn how to communicate. And I had to be thorough in my approach. I had to be enthusiastic and motivating because obviously I couldn't be in command because I'm younger than them. So I'm put in a situation where I had to grow up and learn very, very fast. No question, sure. But because of the because of the confidence that I had had uh, gained from the mental mentality that I developed at a at a very long age, I was extremely confident. I don't think I was cocky, but I had a tremendous amount of faith mm-hmm. and belief in in my religion, and I was an extremely hard worker and respectful with a with what I thought was a sound moral compass that got basically guided my life. As a result, me being in in the head, in the assistant coach position when I'm 23 years old, I'll ask my head coach, can I go on the road recruiting? He said, sure. So he gave me money, and I went to New York recruiting. I had never been to New York in my life. <laughs> so uh, I went to New York. The kid that I met on my first recruiting trip when I didn't know what I was doing was the kid who led the nation in scoring at Austin P. Oh. My first player that I ever spoke to, uh, one was named Danny Odoms and the other one was Fly Williams. They were buddies. I think Dan- Danny might have broke the conference assist record as a freshman. I know he led us in assists. And his buddy, James Fly Williams, he averaged 27 points and nine rebounds a game as a freshman. So there I was Dang. My very first recruiting trip that I did, I didn't even know what I was doing and where I was going. The first two kids I met were starters as freshmen. Dang, and studs. 13 and 13. Yeah. To the NCAA tournament, my first recruiting trip in my life. But then I had to still, while I was doing that, I was uh, in graduate school teaching classes <laughs> and married with, with a child. And on top of that, I had adopted my brother, Willie, who was 17 years old, and I was 23. So so during that time, I was working so hard, not getting very much sleep, that into the next year, I was, uh, I was diagnosed as being physically exhausted. I was having pains in my chest, ears locking, blurred vision. I was passing blood in my urine. Mm. Uh, all the symptoms of being physically exhausted. And they tried to give me eight to 12 hours of bed rest a day to say I was going to do irreparable damage that I couldn't repair to my body. And I had to be in New York the next day, and I left. You said, I don't have eight to 10 hours for bed rest, man. I got to go. That's right. <laughs> but my point to you, I was giving it all I had. Right, and sure. And as a result of us going to the NCAA two years in a row, then my head coach had started getting a lot of recognition because we turned the program around real quick. And at 26, Molly, God had blessed me with some unbelievable level of confidence. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where it came from, but when Coach Kelly started getting mentioned for jobs in the SEC and different places around the country, I I met with the president and asked him, was I going to be the next head coach at Austin Bay? Incredible. Now, I'm 26 years old, and... At the time, I didn't realize there were very few black coaches around the country, mm-hmm. period. Right. No. Yeah. And that was in 73, I think, 74. And I, I loved Dr. Morgan, and he, I had a great relationship with him. And, and I, I have a hard time saying what I'm getting ready to say to you because I get emotional every time I have to recant this story. But I walked in his office, and I asked him, you understand, Coach Kelly is getting recognized mm-hmm. for the good job that he's done. and. But if he get, if he takes a head job, am I going to be the next head coach at Austin Peay mm. at 26? That took confidence. And he said, Leonard, I, I remember like it was yesterday. He said, nothing would make me happier than for you to be the head coach at Austin Peay. And I would support that with everything I got. But I'm retiring in two years, and I'm not real sure I'm going to be strong enough for you to be the first black head coach at Austin Peay. Mm. What'd you say? It cut my guts out. Yeah. To be honest with you, I, I can uh, I can't tell you how uh, it just devastated me because mm-hmm. I didn't know any better. You know, sure. I didn't know 
I went thinking about the mm. climate, the time, the the fact that not very many black head coaches existed, period. For whatever reason, I was caught up in the moment that this needed to be my job, but I was extremely confident that I was prepared and ready because Coach Kelly had prepared me. Mm-hmm. That was on a Wednesday. I was so hurt and disappointed that I felt I had to, I resigned on Thursday. And then what? And I took a job with Dow Chemical. Mm-hmm. I called, and they had been after me about a sales job. And I just felt that if I, if I, with all my hard work and the dedication that, that I had put into it, if I could not be a coach, then I need to go and try something else that my hard work would allow me to benefit. Mm-hmm. And so I left town on that Friday. My wife followed me in her car with my young son. I took my brother, who I had, my brother Willie, I adopted him, and I adopted my other brother, Barry. I put all everybody in the car, put everything I owned in two cars, and went to work on Monday with Dow Chemical in Charlotte, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. And then what happened? Before I left, uh, after the day I resigned, on that Thursday, my head coach had called Joe Hall, along with some other people, had recommended me to Coach Hall. And one of the things that what had happened is that we had lost to Kentucky in a double overtime game with the kids that I had recruited in Nashville, Tennessee, mm-hmm. my, my second year there. And so people in Kentucky were familiar with the work we had done. And my head coach, uh, Dave Kelly, was from Kentucky. And he coached high school ball at Lexington Lafayette. So he was familiar and people familiar with him. So we, I talked to Coach Hall briefly, let him know I would be interested. Well, that Monday when I left for lunch, I worked uh, that Monday. So I went through the whole week. And uh, the Monday, my first day on the job, mm-hmm. I had left for lunch and they told me to go look for some apartments. And but Johnson C. Smith was interested in me being their head coach. I was not interested, but one of my hometown guys was an administrator there, so I had given them the courtesy of coming by and visiting with them at twenty six to list listen to them. But while I was there talking with my friend, I called my wife at the hotel and she told me that Joe Hall had called me. This was the first day on the job with Dow Chemical. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he, had, he had called me in the hotel where I was staying. Mm-hmm. I called him, and he said, would, asked me would I be interested in visiting with him about assistant coach position. And I said, sure. And I said, Coach Hall, can I call you back? <laughs> I hung up the phone and made my own plane reservation <laughs> and called him back and told him that I'd be in there Monday night. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, he was running a camp over, in, I think, a place called Mullinsburg or Mullinsburg, somewhere. I think that was the name of the place. And he told me he wouldn't be back until sometime late on the afternoon on Tuesday. He really wanted to meet on Wednesday, but I wanted <laughs> to meet with him on Tuesday because actually I had started my first day on the job. Sure. So I made my own plane plane reservation, paid for my own ticket, and flew to Lexington, Kentucky. He had someone pick me up. And I spent the night, and I met with him the next afternoon when he got back. And so I worked the rest of the week thinking that I was going to be with Dow Chemical. My goal was to be the number one chemical salesman in the country. Mm -hmm. That was my goal at that point. Sure. But the the next Monday, I was moving my family out of the hotel into an apartment that I was going to put a deposit down on. I came back across the street. I was staying at the Howard Johnson. and, And my wife said, Joe Hall called. And uh, he called. I called him. He offered me the job. I accepted it. I walked back across the street. <laughs> Everybody was at lunch. And I left a message to the supervisor. I'm out. To whom it may concern, I resigned my position here at Dow Chemical, uh, effective immediately. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I went back across the street, put all what I had in the hotel in two cars. And my wife said, I am not driving anywhere. <laughs> She said, she said, I'm sorry if you want me to go. <laughs> but going, I resigned immediately, on. too. 
<laughs> <laughs> so I left Le- Gastonia so fast mm-hmm. that I left a car for my brother. <laughs> I had pots and flowers and plants. I had to leave them on my mother's front yard, and we drove ourselves to Lexington, Kentucky. And that's that is as true a story as ever been told. That's incredible. But the point though is this: I've always said. I've always had a hedge of protection around me. Mm -hmm. God has always ordered my steps. So there I was trying to get out of coaching, Mm -hmm. frustrated because Mm -hmm. I didn't think that I would be having an opportunity to be a head coach because I was Mm African-American. So I wanted to be, my my father taught me to to always work hard. So I said, if I can work hard as a chemical salesman, then, then I can make a knife for myself. But God said, no, he had something else planned mm-hmm, for me. Mm-hmm, absolutely. I mean, so I, I go from not being able to be the head coach at a program that I had dedicated a part of my life to, to going from not having a job to the number one women's program in the history of college basketball. Right. Now, that's not by my design. That's divine intervention. Mm-hmm. So my point to you the first recruiting trip, I signed a kid that averaged 27 points and nine rebounds a game. How does that work? And the school that we played in the NCAA tournament was the University of Kentucky to a double overtime game. How does that work? <laughs> so I get frustrated and I leave coaching and Joe Hall from Kentucky call and offered me a job with the school that we played against with a head coach that coached in Lexington how does all that work if it's not if my steps are not ordered? Amen. So I foolishly tried to get out of coaching, but the man upstairs said, "No, I want you to be in coaching." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's why I feel so happy about what I do. Right. I work with youngsters. I I'm here early. I'm here late. I love what I do. Yeah. We'll get right back to the show, but first, I want to share with you a free video series that I created just for you. Too often, we assume that our potential is some lofty vision hanging over our heads, but never quite attainable. But in reality, our potential is built in small moments. A pro athlete delivers a clutch performance in the biggest games because he executed it a thousand times in practice. The same goes for you. Master the little moments so you're ready for the big moments. My free Unleash Your Potential video series walks you through three simple steps to move closer to what you really are capable of. To get free access, visit 5minutepotential.com. That's five, the number five, minutepotential.com. And coach, you're in your 18th season now at Florida State, right? And you've totally turned the program around. You know, there's no question, obviously, you'll outwork anybody. What's harder, you know, in your world today, right? What's harder, building a winning culture, which you've done, or sustaining it? Most people would tell you they both are challenging. But I believe that when you look back at programs that have been rejuvenated, built from scratch, built from the bottom, had to overcome obstacles. It's extremely challenging because you programs don't get to be in bad shape or uh, have challenges overnight. Right. But people expect you to change them overnight. <laughs> other words, Great point. other words, program, there are reasons why programs are not quite where people want them to be it could be location, it could be revenue, it could be facilities, it could be facilities, it could be distance from the airport, it could be academics, it could be some schools in rural areas with no one to, around to recruit to. I mean, there are different reasons and, and challenges in every job, so it takes a certain kind of personality and, and focus with effort and the imagination to do this. I remember as a a young assistant coach, I'm in Kentucky dreaming about wanting to become a head coach. And so in my mind, I would have this picture. I need to be in a metropolitan area 
where there are plenty of players I can recruit from the playgrounds and the high schools with a program with a nice gym and everybody making plenty of money and where there's interest and the gyms are packed and, uh, you know, where you can go and be successful. In my mind, I'm saying that's what I wanted. But I remember as a young coach, it was almost, I'm in, I'm laying in the bed one night long and when is my opportunity going to come? And it's almost like God reached down from heaven with his long arm and slapped me on the left side of the face <laughs> with one hand and on a backhand on the other side and said, hey, those programs that are in those kind of places don't need you. Mm-hmm. It was almost like it was a revelation that those programs don't need you with your skills. You need to be interested in programs that have not been successful mm. and where other people have not had an opportunity to turn them around. And if you go and do a good job with a place with less, then you will earn your reputation and then he, I, he'll he give me more. So my point to you is that when I came to the realization that I what I wanted was not what I needed. Mm. I needed the challenge of going to a place that needed some fixing up where I could utilize my skills and my determination and my work ethic and my ability to to relate to situations and solve problems. That's where I needed to be. Mm-hmm. Oklahoma State was that ideal situation for me. Non-metropolitan area. I don't think the program had been to the postseason tournament in like, what, 35, 36 years? or something like that. I don't remember what the number was. And so I had an opportunity to go in and put my mark on that program, which made me attractive to the University of Miami. That program was non-existent for 13 years. They didn't have a conference affiliation or even have an, uh, an arena on campus. Well, that's the kind of place I needed to be. And so I have felt that my niche is being a part of going and building as opposed to going somewhere and sustaining. Mm-hmm. And and where I, the jobs that I've had, they all have been tremendously challenging, but that's what I've enjoyed doing. And I feel like this is this has, has been my lane to be in. Now that we are here, where we are here at Florida State, I want this to be my last stop on a positive note. Mm-hmm. And I want, hopefully, that my last stop will be one that, we will, whenever we do decide to retire, which I'm hoping is not anytime soon, <laughs> uh, that that I will leave a program where someone now can maintain it or enhance it as opposed to being put in a position, position to the rebuild or build. Mm-hmm. What are two to three non-basketball characteristics that that you think are most important Um, you know, that you look for as a leader and also that that you look for for guys to be great teammates? In the first place, if I'm coming to your home to recruit your son and your son's of high character, I have to have a program that has a great culture Mm -hmm. that's founded on good, sound, moral foundations that are fulfilling the requirements that you as a parent would need before you can be attractive to my program. Sure. In other words, you need to know that when your child comes to play for me, the most important thing to me is that he he has a, a sound moral compass, but that he's going to get his education and get his degree. If he stays with me for four years, he's going to get his education and his degree. And, and I have some kids who graduate before then and mm-hmm. go on and have their master's degrees before before they leave. You have to feel that, sure, it's about basketball, but the most important thing is I you have to be able to trust me that I'm going to take your teenager who's still trying to grow hair on his face, who's <laughs> true, and, and I, I'm taking him at the, one of the most important times in his life where he is forming his life, his philosophy on how he he's gonna live as a young adult, you have to have the confidence that I'm have I'm the responsible type of person who's gonna continue 
helping your son grow in those areas that are important to you and your family while he's improving as a basketball mm-hmm. player. So you need him to trust you. But in order for you to trust me, I have to have a track record right. that you feel that I'm trustworthy. Sure. And if I'm trustworthy and you feel like you can trust me, then that's where it starts. But if my if my program doesn't have the culture that fits your requirements and you have a high moral standards, then we can't get the first base because you're not going to trust me. And so the first thing I have to have, if I'm going to talk it, I got to walk it. You got to be able to look at my track record and say is that I'm not in your home trying to tell you what I'm going to do for your child if I have not done it for all the other children that I've already had. So the, the most important thing is building a culture and a philosophy within your own program to make sure that you are, you are checking all of the boxes that make someone want to be a part of your program. Now, obviously, uh, you want to win games and you want to be able to fulfill those. But in my opinion, if, if I don't check those other boxes, I, I, I wouldn't expect you to want your child to come play for. Mm-hmm. But understand this. I wasn't a perfect kid. I had a little edge to me. I heard about that. I wasn't the kind of guy now, you know, I, I wasn't no choir boy. <laughs> Even though I tried to do, I mean, I had a little of the, the ghetto mentality. I had a little slickness in me. And I need to be around people who can help me grow as well. Mm-hmm. So I'm not, a, I'm not afraid to take a kid who might have a little edge to him because if I hadn't had somebody help me in life, where would I be? Mm, that's awesome. But I find that those kids normally confirm, they confirm, they end up being what you allow them to be. But there's no question that I want to have kids in a program. I want to have moral sound uh, uh, kids with high character. There's no doubt about that. But I've had a few that I had to put my arm around and put them in a headlock mm-hmm. and, and, and help them grow to mature. I needed a little bit of that myself. But but for the most part, I think that kids understand what they signed up for when and, and the parents understand when they do come mm-hmm. to our program. I'm a no-nonsense kind of guy. I keep everything up a board. I communicate. I try to be open and honest. I have drug education, sex education, academic seminars, we teach them how to handle the, the business on and off the court and academically. You don't play if you don't take care of your books. Simple. You know, yeah. I don't I don't yeah. scream and holler and cuss at kids. I'm not a I'm not a tyrant. I don't run a military state. It's just that these are the things we require. And uh if you do what you're supposed to do, then everybody's happy. If you don't, everybody's ducking. Well, and some of the some of the, the best coaches, in my opinion, do such a good job of loving their guys to death. You know, giving them, being there for them, hugging them, right, uh, supporting them on and off the court. But they also have an incredible ability to give really tough feedback. You know, like you said, you put some guys in headlocks. How how do you approach giving tough feedback to guys or to your staff? No, no, no. It's every day we's consistent with our approach in everything that we do. We hold everybody accountable and including ourselves. Mm-hmm. And it's the, it starts at the top. I'm going to give it everything I have. I'm going to be accountable. I want everybody in the program, everybody, from the managers to every person in our program, we all hold each other accountable. And that's the standard that we live by. Mm-hmm. And when you cross the line and you deviate what you're saying is you're waving your hand saying, come and check me. Yeah. Also, I'm not, I'm not living by the creed. And we have very little issues because everybody understands where the line is drawn. Mm-hmm. You know, Coach, your teams always find a way to win. It, it, it just seems like they find a way. How have you developed a level of toughness in your program and, and resiliency in, in, in your program? Molly, everybody thinks that we have the formula. I'm who I am. Mm-hmm. I'm easy. I'm consistent. I like to think that my program is a reflection of the philosophy that I have. But you know, in this day and time, you have so many distractions, so many people who are trying to tell kids 
how to get to a place in life where they've never been themselves. You know, everybody, everybody got a road map. They tell you how to get there, but at first they don't know where you are and they've never been to where they're trying to tell you to go. <laughs> and it becomes a real challenge because a lot of the people who have the attention in the ears of the players uh, giving them information that they read and heard about but have not really experienced. Sure. And so sometimes you're in conflict with people who care the most about your players and they don't mean any harm because they have helped them get to that point but in order to get to that next level. So you have to find ways to communicate without negatively uh, implying things against people who who care the most about them, we have to try to find a way to get them across the finish line with the experience we have is a delicate balance I bet. of how you communicate. So you, in order to get that done, you have to have a relationship where everybody respects each other mm -hmm. and they have to, uh, the way they believe and trust in each other. And you, 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 you have to work at trying to develop that atmosphere within your program with the relationships not only the coaches have with the players, but what the players have with each other. When everybody's from a different place with different people in their ears and different environments and different goals of what they're trying to do in life. And sometimes sometimes when, uh, and with a team, you have people with conflicting goals and approaches. Sometimes the goals are the same, but everybody's approach is different. It's not unusual for a parent who really loves their children to be telling a guy who's not a very good shooter, you need to take more shots. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, they don't mean, they don't mean any harm. They sure. just want, they want their loved one to be more successful. And the person could be the best assist person in the country, mm -hmm. the best defender, the best decision maker, and probably the most critical person to us winning. But that's not how people on the outside sometimes look at it. And so, you have to find a way to be respectful to any and everybody and just try to have a philosophy within your program that the kids come to the point where this is best for us as a team and this is how we do it. And, and that's not always as easy. In any sport, at any level, uh, high school, junior high school, college, or professionally, we, we all have those those challenges of trying to get everyone to play together and play as a unit. So it's challenging. Mm -hmm. You know, I know, Coach, you're always looking for ways to get better, and you talk about this. What are some of the ways that you personally uh, try to keep getting better, keep learning, you know, keep keep your edge? Well, for me personally, one of, one of my biggest strengths, I believe, is that I can self-evaluate myself and my strengths and my weaknesses. Mm. I'm not a cocky person to feel like I got all the answers. When it's something that I'm not quite as up on, I'll admit it to myself and I work hard at trying to make sure I learn and study and prepare myself. I'm also, so because of my first job with Lake Kelly, there I was 23 years old. This man gave me an opportunity to mm -hmm, learn mm -hmm. and grow in my program, in his program. When I went to Kentucky, Joe Hall gave me an opportunity to be involved intimately in every part of the program. And so I involved my assistant coaches in in every phase, and they have tremendous amount of responsibilities. But what I do is try to hire people who I have confidence in, mm -hmm. who are good people who, who relate well to my players. And so I've been blessed with those instincts, and I think that I surround myself with people who feel gaps maybe where maybe I'm not quite as strong or whether or not I need some help because I didn't. And when I put, like Stan Jones had been with me for almost 25 years. That's awesome. My weight training conditioning coach has been with me about 20 years. That's awesome. It says a lot about you as a leader. Coach Young, I recruited when he was in high school. Jeez. And Steve Smith, I've watched him grow. So I surround myself with people. My basketball of operation was a uh, manager in my program when he was in when, when he was uh, in college, Dennis Gates, who just left me and went to uh, Cleveland State, he was a graduate assistant in my program. Wow, that's cool. So I surround myself. So I, you know, I've been fortunate with some instincts. Sometimes I'm not always perfect, 
but I really follow my own God-given instincts. Mm-hmm. Trust yourself. Yeah, I do. I trust myself. Mm-hmm. Coach, you've been generous with your time. It's such a busy time of year for you and certainly uh, cheering for you uh, this March. Let me ask you this. We end with uh, rapid fire, so I'm going to just hit you with some quick questions and you just uh, fire back what comes up. Is that cool? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, man. You got it. There's two seconds left in the game, and we're just, you know, throwing it out. All right? You can handle the pressure. I know it. So one word to describe you. Focus. One word your players would use to describe you. They probably would say focus. Mm, okay. What's the best advice you've ever received? Don't let anybody outwork me and don't make any excuses. Mm-hmm. Who's the, been the greatest influence on your life? Well, probably my father. Mm. That's a treat. That's wonderful. What's your biggest pet peeve, Coach? Lack of competitive spirit. Mm. One word to describe Florida State basketball. Okay. If this is a... You want to understand is That's okay. New blood. The reason I say that because there are blue blood programs that we will... We'll never be able to gain 75 or 80 years of successful tradition Mm -hmm. that the programs in the ACC have ahead of us. In other words, the Notre Dame, the Carolina, the Dukes, the Syracuse, Louisville, those programs have 75, 80 years of successful tradition basketball program mm-hmm. so maybe maybe we might not ever become the blue blood got it but we the new blood i love it i love it coach the show's called game changer so so one last question what game changer inspires you and why so who's a game changer that inspires you and why john thompson mm. see a guy you admire yes no question Hey, Coach, you've been generous with your time, uh, and we are certainly cheering for you. Thank you for these pearls of wisdom. They will help our listeners. Um, so thank you so much, and, and, and all the best in March. Thank you. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There, you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.